A well-regulated militia be necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I am so glad that you are with us today. Coming up on the program here in just a minute or two, we're going to talk with Cibola County, New Mexico Sheriff Tony Mays about the uh, governor of New Mexico, Michelle Lujan Grisham, who apparently is on the uh, short list for uh, Joe Biden's vice presidential pick. Yes, how about that? Before we get to that, though, we do have a little bit of news to get to. Uh, at BarryandArms.com, I reported uh, earlier today story out of Chicago, actually story out of Illinois, 42,000 Illinois residents applying for their firearms owner ID card just since the 1st of June. That is a 500% increase in the number of Illinois residents who uh, want to purchase a firearm. Now, in order to buy a gun legally and possess a gun legally, even in your home in Illinois, you have to have that firearms owner ID card. There are lawsuits that are challenging that requirement right now, uh, in part because of the delays that the state was already experiencing, uh, you know, back in, uh, in 2019 in terms of issuing these FOID cards. Well, now that delay has grown even longer. You've got folks who've applied back in March who are still waiting for their FOID card. So the 42,000 Illinois residents who've applied just since June the 1st, they can be twiddling their thumbs for months uh, while they want to protect themselves and their families. We're going to be following that story closely because there is, again, litigation going on. Illinois State Rifle Association, Second Amendment Foundation uh, have filed lawsuits. There are also other constitutional challenges to the uh, FOID card itself that are making their way through the Illinois legal system. Uh, so we are paying close attention to what's going on there. But what has happened in Illinois is being replicated, quite frankly, uh, all across the country as more and more Americans embrace their right to keep and bear arms because of the unrest that we've seen, because of the protest, not I don't want to say the protest, because of the violence that we've seen in the streets, because of the increase in things like homicide that we have seen in cities from coast to coast, uh, whether it's Los Angeles, California, New York City, cities in between, uh, Americans are responding by embracing their right to keep and bear arms. Now, the Trump campaign has a special offer just for you. President Trump would like to meet you. It's going to be the first opportunity that the president has had to talk with American patriots like yourself since the country started reopening. So his team, ready to cover the flight, hotel, give you VIP access for yourself and a guest. President Trump will even take a picture with you as well. All you have to do is text ENGAGE to 88022 today for your chance to meet President Trump. Again, that's E-N-G-A-G-E to 88022 to enter to win this contest and to join President Trump in the fight to keep America great for four more years. So let's get to our conversation with Cibola County, New Mexico Sheriff Tony Mace. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham, apparently on the short list to be uh, vice president uh, if Joe Biden were to win election. Uh, CNBC reported this a couple of days ago. Sheriff Mace uh, there in Cibola County has been dealing with, I, I'd, I'd, I'd love to be able to say working with, Governor Grisham, but unfortunately, that's not the case. Governor Grisham has not wanted to hear what Sheriff Mace and other law enforcement officers and Second Amendment supporters and gun owners have had to say. Instead, she has spent the past couple of years cramming down ineffective, unconstitutional and largely unenforceable gun control laws uh, against New Mexico residents. Now, the uh, effort is shifting a bit to uh, uh, police reform measures. It's fascinating, though, is that Sheriff Mace says that uh, gun control groups are still being able to uh, work hand in hand with the governor and lawmakers while law enforcement officers continue to be shut out. Take a look and a listen. Sheriff, thank you so much sir, for coming on the program. It's great talking with you today. Uh, good morning, Cam. Thanks for having me as well. It's great talking with you. You bet. How are things going in uh, Cibola County? I know it's been a little bit since we've had a chance to catch up. Uh, have you guys been allowed by the governor to to start to reopen? I know that as the rest of the state opened up, uh, Cibola County was thrown in with a couple of counties that had uh, admittedly, pretty large outbreaks of the uh, coronavirus uh, there in Cibola County. You all did not, but uh, Governor Grisham lumped you guys in with these other counties and kept you guys on lockdown a little bit longer. How are things going in Cibola County right now? So you know, Cibola County, we're still uh, we're still on some of those um, uh, I'll call them extreme restrictions um, for no reason. Um, we're uh, actually today at three o'clock. Uh, the governor is supposed to make an announcement on. Um, gradually opening up some more um, some more stuff within a state. Uh, but New Mexico still has some of the heaviest restrictions 
out of the nation um, when it comes to the lockdown of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So. Yeah, that's, I mean, it, it's ridiculous. I mean, I'm looking here, you Cibola County right now, 203 confirmed cases. That's not active cases, that's total cases. Uh, McKinley County, uh, 3,179. San Juan County, 2,250. Uh, and, and you all were lumped in with those counties and, and, and uh, you know, kept on lockdown. I'm going to ask you, I mean, do you think that that was a, 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 a health decision or was that a political decision on the part of the governor? You know, I think this whole thing is a political uh, decision on the part of the governor. Um, we all know that she's on the uh, short list for the, well, if you don't know, she's on the short list for the uh, vice president's um, uh, seat. Um, so I think a lot of what she's doing is politics, the dog and pony show, show and tell, you know, show her party that uh, that she has the power and uh, falls right in line with some of their socialist agenda. And just, um, you know, that was one of the things that just came up in our special session is, is uh, limiting the power of the governor on these uh, pandemics and what they can and can't do. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking at a story from uh, CNBC just a couple of days ago. A prominent health record in a pandemic why New Mexico Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham could be Biden's vice presidential pick, uh, saying that her deep background in health and aging could bring authority to the Biden campaign's message on the coronavirus pandemic. I, I, you know, that 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 may very well be. And I'm sure the media will, uh, you know, do their best to present a glowing portrait of the governor. But uh, again, there is that other side of Governor Grisham's response to the pandemic, uh, you know, keeping these counties in lockdown and and. You know, you've been a, a critic of the governor for several years, going back to, uh, I think, her first attempts to, uh, excuse me, impose gun control laws on the uh, people of New Mexico. Uh, you know, starting with, what was it, the uh, the, the universal background check bill, uh, which not only uh, originally was rejected by the state legislature, but led to really the, the Second Amendment sanctuary movement in the state of New Mexico. Most of the counties in the state uh, objected to what the governor was doing, but the governor didn't want to sit down and listen to anybody. Uh, no, and, you know, we've seen that again uh, in our special session. Uh, they, closed, uh, they closed the House and limited, uh, didn't allow any public comment during the special session. And they were talking about some pretty hot topics, you know, when it comes to the way we're going to vote, um, police reform, um, the, the, the way the governor's authority during the pandemic. Um, but they voted, the legislature voted to close the state capitol down don't allow any public input or anything um, again. So, you know, we see that real dictatorship uh, that came in with her uh, when she came into office. We've seen it right away off the bat when, uh, when with the universal background checks um, with a lot of her gun control measures. Um, you know, there's the Every Town for Gun Safety, uh, Moms Demand Action, you know, all these Bloomberg-backed groups that are heavily embedded, uh, embedded with her and even now in this special session, even though the public was locked out, um, there were several um, moms, uh, individuals from the Moms Demand Action Group allowed into the legislature, and they were in there um, putting input on why we should have the, uh, they were pushing uh, Senate Bill 8, which is the, uh, the use of body cameras for law enforcement. Um, that bill passed, it's on its way to the governor's desk for signature. And one of the most, I mean, I don't, the body camera is not an issue. Um, it's the other language that's uh, written into the bill that takes immunity away from law enforcement. So now you're going to, you know, they can't defund the law enforcement. They got a big pushback on that. So now what they're doing is they took the immunity out. So slowly but surely, law enforcement officers, you're going to drive them out of the profession because they're going to be uh, susceptible to frivolous civil lawsuits over and over and over. And, uh Nobody wants to lose what they've worked so hard for. Absolutely. And it, 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 I just want to make sure I'm clear here. You're saying that you know, despite the fact that the public was shut out of this uh, special session, Moms Demand Action had a seat at the table. I, I, I can't imagine any uh, uh, pro-Second Amendment groups had a seat at the table. Did were, were you able to go in? Were other law enforcement officers able to go in and, and sit down and uh, voice your objections? Or were you guys shut out Absolutely. too? Every, pretty much everybody was shut out. There was no input from any, from what I understand, from any law enforcement official on this. A lot of the uh, input came from the uh, municipal league or the association of counties, which they were equally frustrated as, you know, why isn't there, 
you, you know, you're, you're trying to enact a law and, um, but you're not getting any input from the people that it's going to affect. And then you're driving the cost of insuring municipal law enforcement agencies and counties, uh, through the roof when you take out that immunity. But yeah. the, the people that it's going to affect didn't have a seat at the table, but you have this super liberal group that's there just rallying for this stuff. And, um, you know, when, uh, again, you talk about uh, these special interest groups, you know, we were getting bought and paid for legislation in our state from uh, from outside groups. You know, and it's 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 fascinating to me because uh, I, I've written about this several times. Gun control groups, uh, frankly, you know, it, it's interesting. You know, the, the left has adopted uh, uh, police reform and, you know, going after things like qualified immunity. Uh, and gun control groups, even though they need law enforcement to enforce the gun control laws that they put on the books, they, they you know, they they also need their allies on the left. So they're stuck in this, I think, conundrum here where all of a sudden now the, the laws that they've been pushing uh, in terms of, you know, restricting our right to keep and bear arms, they don't want to talk as much about that right now. They're sort of pivoting and shifting towards, well, let's let's talk about police, police violence is gun violence, uh, as uh, I saw one gun control group say the other day. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, you know, Governor Grisham didn't didn't like it when law enforcement officers said, listen, we uh, we don't think we're going to uh, uh, really, you know, use this uh, universal background check law. We don't we don't really like this red flag law. Um, at that point, the governor and gun control groups demanded that there be an armed response from the state. Right. Uh, in these situations where they want their gun control laws enforced. Well, and, and, and that just did, as you see, you see that, you see these special interest groups shifting towards police reform and everything else. They're not saying so much about the gun control. We have record numbers of gun purchases and ammunition purchases across the nation. The, uh, the, the NIC system, the, the federal NIC system background checks have, uh, have almost tripled. And, um, now you've got these people that were so anti-gun and anti-protection. Now they're kind of being hush hush about it because they realize that there's that necessity, that is a necessity, and that's what you need to protect life, liberty, and property, right? Um, in in these crazy times, when especially if you're talking about driving away your law enforcement agency, who's going to protect your life, liberty, and property? It's going to be up to you, as an individual, to uh, protect your life, liberty, and property. And um, but I get you know you you got these. Even some of the special interest groups like Mom Demand Action, Every Town, you know, they're realizing um, that, that 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 is clear and present right now. And these laws that they push, like the universal background check, the red flag law, all, all these ridiculous gun control measures, we have used absolutely none of them in uh, since they have been enacted as law. Um, and, and it just goes to show that if you base your decisions on a factual basis and listen to the boots on the ground, the people that are that, that, that are that are telling you this isn't the answer, this isn't the work, this it's not gonna work, it's not something that we can use, you know, now now we just got laws on the books that it's ink on paper. It's not something that law enforcement is using. Yeah, absolutely. I, in fact, I was going to ask you, I mean, I, I, I know that the universal background check law, uh, you and I have talked about this before. I mean, not only is it, uh, uh, useless. I think it's nearly impossible for, for law enforcement to actually enforce. Um, but what about the, the red flag law that's uh, now in effect in the state? Is that being used? Uh, uh have, have you had an occasion to have to, uh, to, to, uh, enforce a, uh, a red flag uh, gun seizure order? I, I have not at my office and up to date, uh, with the other sheriffs that we communicate with regularly. Um, I do not believe that any of them. Have you have have had an offer to have that had that presented to them? And you know, a lot of the sheriffs across the state have already said, you know, we're not going to enforce that law. We're not going to use that law. We're going to find another way to deal with that individual in crisis. And now, you make that even more. So we talked about the governor and her lockdown of the COVID nineteen stuff, restricting closing the gun stores. You've limited people to exercise their constitutional right to bear arms because you closed the gun stores. You made it mandatory by the universal background check to go to a gun dealer to buy a gun. So you, you've restricted people to exercise their constitutional right. Now, when we talk about the red flag, you're, um, 
you've taken away with Senate Bill 8 the, out of the special session, the knee-jerk reaction that they have, you've taken away the law enforcement immunity and left them more susceptible to lawsuits. So they're going to even sneer more away from enforcing that red flag uh, law because, again, you know, though we know that those things escalate situations rather than de-escalate them. So you're going to create an opportunity for more lawsuits and more, more, more revenue loss for the county. So you're going to see law enforcement step even more, more, more away from. Well, and, and and not only that, sheriff, but you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I know in Virginia we we've, we've got our red flag law that's getting ready to go on the books to uh, take effect July the first, uh, and in Virginia. There is no mention. The words mental health do not appear anywhere in the red flag law. Uh, and so, you know, again, we're hearing a lot of talk about, well, listen, you know, defund the police doesn't mean abolish the police. It just means that the police are doing things they don't need to be doing. We need more mental health services. Maybe social workers should be responding to some of these calls. Well, gun control advocates have been pushing a measure that, uh, you know, allows for the seizure of firearms uh, without the mental health system getting involved at all. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's the police. They go to a judge. The judge, without ever uh, talking to the person in question, decides, eh, maybe there's a 51% chance this person poses a threat to themselves or others. Go ahead and take their guns. Uh, then a couple of weeks later, the person actually can go before the judge. The judge will talk to them for the first time. Maybe they get their guns back. Maybe they don't. But nowhere in that system, which is supposedly dealing with people who have mental health issues, is there a place for mental health? I, I, isn't that the case in New Mexico, too? Absolutely. There is nothing in the bill that deals with mental health, people in crisis, any type of psychiatrist, uh, you know, any type of medical profession. It's maybe you, you can get denied your right to bear arms without even committing a crime based off of somebody else's opinion or somebody else's statement. There is nothing in there that, that includes the medical profession on, on your mental state. Um, it, it's all done by opinion from either a law enforcement officer or a judge. Yeah. And I just find it fascinating that, you know, gun control advocates like Governor Grisham, this is what they wanted right up until, uh, you know, the left decided, oh, no, actually, we don't want stuff like this. Now we want to de-police. Now we want to, uh, you know, take police out of these situations. Of course, they haven't officially come out and said maybe red flag laws are a bad idea, right? They never admit wrongdoing. They never admit fault. They never admit even when they're when they're in contradiction with their own ideology, uh, instead their answer is to simply try to slap more gun control laws on the books. So um, the, the interesting thing about all this defunding the police and different things that's going on across the nation is Albuquerque being a metropolitan city has, has uh, jumped on that wagon as well. Well, rather than increasing their police force with uniformed officers on the street to respond to some of these calls, they're creating a, I'm not sure the whole details of it, but they're talking about creating another police unit um, that um, to deal with some of these issues. Um, that they're not going to be as long, they're not going to be law enforcement officers per se. They're not going to be armed. They're just going to be responding to some of these other calls to try to de-escalate the situation in sense of a social worker um, to de-escalate the situation. But again, you know the. the, the it's easier to do that than admit that they're wrong with the with, with the uh, with the red, with the push on the red flag laws that really just strip people's rights without even committing a crime. Absolutely. So you know, listen, I, I know that you're a Democrat. Um, what what advice would you give the Biden campaign? Would you uh, uh, why would you tell them that uh, Governor Grisham is not uh, the right choice for uh, Joe Biden's running mate? You know, I think uh, here in New Mexico, you, New Mexico is a pretty conservative state still, um, and you see this, you see this push and a lot of influx from a lot of the liberal voters coming in. Uh, there's a handful of them that are trying to um, that are trying to change the way that we think, do things in New Mexico, and um, I think come November, uh, the citizens have had enough with the restrictions on the COVID nineteen. Business after business after business is closed. Um, rural New Mexico counties are, are starving. Their their economic development has had at least a twenty to thirty percent decrease. Um, people are sick and tired of the attack on their gun rights, their constitutional rights. I think come November, um, the citizens are gonna the citizens are gonna wake up and they're gonna send a message um, across the whole state that hey, 
We don't like that. And that's where we change things is when we visit the polls and we vote. Research the candidates, find out who, who fits best uh, within your conservative values or whatever you believe in, and vote those people into office. And I'm thinking, I'm hoping that people that, that, that people have had enough of this push towards socialism and they send a message out there and really let them know that, hey, this is not what people want. They don't want this dictatorship. They want somebody that's going to be connected with the people and they're going to listen to the people and they're going to, and, and within the state of New Mexico, not a special interest group from, from outside. One last question for you, Sheriff. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, Joe Biden's uh, mental acuity, his his age, and and you know there's uh, there, there's I guess maybe some concern that uh, you know Joe Biden uh, may not be able to even you know fulfill a, a four year term. Certainly uh, might have some problems uh, serving a second term. So the idea be that you know his vice presidential pick uh, is really important because that that person could very well end up in the Oval Office uh, if Joe Biden were to get elected. When you think about the idea of a president, Michelle Lujan Grisham, what's your reaction? You know, my first reaction is, is when we go to the polls and vote, just know that, you know, you're not necessarily going to be voting for Biden. You're going to be voting for that vice president seat as well to potentially take over as president. And, I mean, some people across New Mexico, they'll be like, take her, get her out of our state. You know, but, but when you talk about politics, there's always an under. There's always an alligator in the water. There's always something lurking. What is the ulterior motive here? And I, I think we've been able to uncover that. And um, I just, you know, um, I hope the voters pay attention to the dictatorship and the ruling that she's done in New Mexico and really look at that. Um, should she get selected for that position? Look at that when you go to the polls. And, and, if that's what, and, and you know, we really got to be careful across the nation and look at who we're electing into office. Because, you know, we are seeing unprecedented, just, just our nation is in turmoil right now with, with some of the stuff that the Democratic Party is pushing. And um, we don't need that. And, um, and, and it just, we really need to pay attention who we're sending, who, 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 we're, who we're electing to represent us, the people. Sheriff Tony Mason, the Cibola County, New Mexico. As always, sir, it's great talking with you today. I appreciate uh, you joining us on the program. Appreciate everything you do and look forward to catching up again very soon. Thanks, Cam. Thanks for having me. And you have a great day and uh, happy 4th of July and celebrate your independence accordingly. Yes, sir. Happy Independence Day. Uh, Cibola County, New Mexico, Sheriff Tony Mace joining us here on Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. All right, before we get to our good deed of the day, our armed citizen story, our uh, recidivist report, Again, uh, just a reminder that the Trump campaign has a special offer just for you. President Trump would like to meet you. This will be the first opportunity that the president has had to meet with the American people like yourself since the country started reopening. So his team cover the flight, hotel, give you VIP access for yourself and a guest. The president will even take a picture with you as well. All you have to do is text ENGAGE to 88022 today for your chance to meet President Trump. Again, that's E N G A G E to 88022 to enter to win this contest and to join President Trump in the fight to keep America great for four more years, paid for by Donald J. Trump for President Incorporated. Uh, Let's turn our attention right now to um, uh, our recidivist report. We will start there. Story out of Gastonia, North Carolina, where a man uh, got probation after pleading guilty to firing a gun into the home. Now, uh, uh, this uh, 21-year-old, who got this probationary sentence, Divine Jalen Hill, had originally been charged with first-degree murder uh, back on April the 2nd when he was arrested. Police say that on February 19th, Hill fired six rounds from a 9mm handgun into a home that was occupied by a Gastonia woman. woman told Gastonia police officers that uh, the bullet holes caused some $3,000 in damage to the home, caused $300 in damage to a dresser drawer, Uh, During an appearance on Monday of this week, Hill agreed to plead guilty to one count of discharging a weapon into occupied property. So down from attempted murder to discharging a weapon into occupied property. In exchange for the plea bargain, Prosecutor Chad Smith, not the drummer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, I don't think, anyway, could be a second-time job, I guess, Uh, he agreed to dismiss the attempted first-degree murder as well as felony conspiracy charges 
Then the judge sentenced Hill to between 20 and 36 months in prison, but suspended the entire sentence on the condition that Hill undergo probation for 30 months. Now, this is generally called the recidivist report. It should be noted that uh, Divine Hill has no prior convictions. He was credited with 81 days that he spent in jail awaiting his court date. Uh, Chelsea Marina Perkins, uh, who's 25, also of Gastonia, also charged with uh, a fir- attempted first-degree murder, uh, cyber-stalking and conspiracy. Uh, she remains in custody on $500,000 bond. 19-year-old Alyssa Marie Royalty, also charged with conspiracy in the February 19th shooting. She was arrested and released on April the 3rd after posting $25,000 bond. So it, it, it sounds like there was some sort of coordinated attempt, or at least a group of individuals came up with the idea of, hey, let's go shoot up this house. Now, again, as we talked about in yesterday's program, about 97% of felony cases in this country end up in plea bargains. So we're hearing a lot of talk about criminal justice reform. We're hearing a lot of talk about police reform. We are hearing nothing about that problem in our criminal justice system, which results in violent offenders walking away with nothing more than a slap on the wrist. What does Joe Biden want to do? Well, Joe Biden wants to put more gun control laws on the books, right? He wants to uh, empower states to uh, have gun licensing laws, gun registration laws. Of course, he wants to ban AR-15s. And if you don't register them with the federal government under the National Firearms Act, you'd be guilty of a federal felony for a nonviolent possessory offense, for doing something that right now, and, and frankly, even if Biden were to pass this law, would be protected under the Second Amendment. But Biden wants to put more of these laws on the books. He wants to put more people in prison for nonviolent crimes. Meanwhile, violent offenders like Mr. Hill get sweetheart deals after nearly killing a woman. I have, I have no clue how that can be seen as justice. Now, I hope fervently that Mr. Hill will take advantage of this deal that he has received. I hope that uh, he will walk out of court or walked out of court and we a sigh of relief and thought, man, I got to turn my life around. I got to find some new friends to hang out with. I really got to do things differently because I don't want to end up in prison. I don't know that that's how Mr. Hill feels, though, because sadly, what we've also seen is that when individuals who get sentenced to probation for violent crimes and then turn around and violate that probation, quite often nothing happens. So what kind of message does that send? It sends the message that the uh, criminal justice system doesn't really care. Doesn't give a damn. And you can violate your conditions of probation with impunity. Maybe you'll go to jail for a couple of weeks. But he certainly, if he were to violate his probation tomorrow, would not go to prison for that 30-month term that he was sentenced to by the judge there in Gastonia, North Carolina. All right, on to today's uh, armed citizen story. Cleveland, Ohio, WKYC, with the story of a uh, Cleveland resident who fatally shot an alleged burglar, apparently a former tenant of the home, Officials responded to uh, this home about 9.20 on uh, Wednesday morning on reports of a burglary and a shooting, according to uh, Channel 3 in Cleveland. uh, At the scene, the uh, victim, well, the victim, the the would-be intruder, uh, found shot inside the home, later uh, passed away at a local hospital. Uh, Witnesses uh, tell police that this uh, gentleman, uh, LeVar Overton, had broken into the home and was then fatally shot by the resident, a 40-year-old man. Police say that Overton was a former tenant, uh, again, at that residence, but had no connection uh, to the current resident of that home. The uh, resident left the location after the shooting, turned himself over to police, though, uh, has been cooperative, uh, was questioned by police, later released. The incident remains under investigation, but right now uh, would appear to be a a clear-cut case of self-defense. Uh, there in Cleveland, Ohio. We'll keep our eyes on any further updates and we'll bring them to you as they become available. Finally, today, our good deed of the day from uh, Suffolk, Long Island. LongIsland.com reports a police officer helped deliver a baby Wednesday night in uh, Center Reach, Long Island. Officer Jessica Proyos was uh, responding to a call, 911 call, about a, a woman in labor. And uh, when she got there, actually, before she even got there, she's on her way to the call. Uh, she ran across the mother about to give birth there in the back seat of a car. Uh, that mom, Ashley Silvering, was uh, in the throes of labor. Officer uh, Proyos assisted the woman, helped deliver a baby girl just a few moments after arriving on scene. 
The uh, 37-year-old mom and her newborn transported to a local hospital there in uh, good condition. And uh, Officer Proeos went on her way and uh, continued to uh, protect and serve the community there. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to wash your hands because, you know, I've, I've got five kids and I can tell you firsthand that uh, the delivery can be a little messy. But uh, in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Officer Proyos there in uh, Suffolk County, Long Island, Suffolk County, New York, we uh, certainly do appreciate your very good deed. That is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. Uh, make sure that you're following uh, what we're talking about at BearingArms.com throughout today, constantly updating with the more information. We've got news that we reported on yesterday out of Los Angeles, where the Los Angeles County Sheriff, Alex Villanueva, says that he plans on increasing the number of concealed carry licenses in the county by some 400%, which sounds fantastic. And it look, make no mistake, it's a step in the right direction. But... Los Angeles County has about 10 million residents, and as of 2018, they had about 400 concealed carry licenses. Most of those going, by the way, to former police, reserve officers, judges, uh, only a handful of concealed carry licenses uh, in the possession of, of average citizens. The average citizen simply cannot get a, uh, a concealed carry license in Los Angeles County. So even if you want to increase those numbers by 400%, you're talking about just a few thousand people uh, in Los Angeles County that would be able to exercise their right to bear arms. That would be far fewer than neighboring counties like Orange County with a third of the population of L.A. County and 12,000 concealed carry licenses. So, again, step in the right direction for Sheriff Villanueva, but it's a baby step. There's still a long way to go before the uh, Second Amendment is even close to being recognized there in Los Angeles County. We've got an update on that story coming up later today and uh, much more. We will talk to you tomorrow, and we certainly do appreciate you being a part of today's program. Until we speak again, be safe, be well, be free, and we'll see you soon with another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company.